And you're live on YouTube. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. It's Wednesday, October 26th, and uh, as always, we're here to talk to you about your favorite subject of mine, Jeeps, and Jeep parts, and building Jeeps. Um, today, we're coming to you on both Facebook and YouTube, so it uh, doesn't matter what platform you're watching on, you can comment in there, and uh, Jeff or Jamie will read that back. Just make sure you include as much information about your vehicle and what you're trying to do, and then I'll try and answer the question. So, um, let's see. Um, if you're not familiar with this show, it is where I answer random questions. We've got a subject to talk about today, which is going to be how to keep your Jeep safe um, after you've gone on a run. What, what are you looking for? Um, we've got Terramoto here in the lift. And uh, we've just had it out for a few days out at the hammers, running it hard. So I'm going to show you all the things to look for. And uh, then you'll kind of know. Your Jeep obviously will look a little bit different, but the basic concept is the same. So um, anyways, make sure that um, you do subscribe uh, on YouTube and uh, that you turn on your notifications. We're posting new videos every week, sometimes more than each week. And uh, if you're following us on Facebook or Instagram, make sure that you click the follow button or the like button so that uh, we know you're there. Um, let's see, if you've got our parts on your Jeep and you're happy with them, please go over to our website and post a review. I sure appreciate that. Just a short one is fine. And uh, down at the bottom of any page on our website, is a spot where you can sign up for our newsletter if you're not getting that. Um, that's where we release some specials and stuff. The other thing I want to remind everybody is our app. Um, we've got the brand new, it's free on Apple or Android. Download our app, create a profile in there, and uh, there's a whole bunch of discussion groups that will be specific to you. And uh, we're releasing a whole bunch of new stuff that you will get advanced notice on if you've got the app. So. Um, check that out if you have a chance. All right, um, let's kind of get into this. Um, I want to start with uh, the obvious that's sitting here in front of me. I broke a uh, front U-joint this last weekend, and uh, I don't know, can we see that pretty good? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk right over here so they can't miss it. All right, you ought to be able to see that. Busted the, the ear right off of it, you know, compared to this side and um, it totally trashed the side that it broke. So we had to cut that off and then slide this whole thing out. Fortunately, I had a brand new one and uh, was able to do that. I was a little surprised that it broke what I would call so easy. Um, it may have been stressed, but uh, yeah, this yeah, You don't this stress things. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's spin around, James, and uh, look at the front of the Jeep. I'll turn this light so we got a little bit of light there. And um, what, what I'm looking for is, um, you know, you can see where some fluids run down. And um, what you want to do is you want to investigate where that's coming from. So um, that's, that's like the most obvious thing. The next obvious thing is anything that's got a shiny spot on it. And, um, you know, that way you're looking to see if it's rubbing, you know, if it rubbed through the paint, that means it's rubbing pretty hard. Um, I have torque sealed my stuff. So you can see here, can they see that pretty good, Jamie? The torque seal. Yeah. yeah, pretty good. So it's a little mark. You can, by the way, you can do this with just a Sharpie, right? But if you see that turned, then you know that the nut backed off or the tube has moved and you'll know, you can see I've got it, you know, over here. I've got it in a number of places on my RAM. Um, it's one of those things that gives me the quick visual to know that I don't even have to put a wrench on that. I know it's still tight. Um, the other thing I'm looking for is um, anything that's sitting funny. You know, if the, if the pitman arm's twisted, that means maybe the splines on the sector shaft are twisted. Um, your, your steering, by the way, takes a beating when you're out there. Um, whether you realize it or not, and if you go fast at all, then the uh, it's really working hard. 
So I'm, I'm constantly after, you know, bolts, anything associated with the, the, the steering and attachment. Um, you can see that I did scrape it and it's slightly bent my tie rod. So um, that's going to need a little bit of attention. So what I do is I pull that off and I put it um, in a 20 ton press. And when you straighten this properly, it actually strengthens it. So this is already 4130 heat treated chromoly. And um, when I rebend it, I'll make sure that uh, it's done properly. And then that will give it some additional work hardening strength. So, um, you know, those, those are some of the main things. Then I start looking around at welds, you know, to make sure I don't see anything um, cracked. You know, I'm, a, a lot of the time, and if you notice, I haven't cleaned the Jeep purposely uh, because what will happen is uh, a crack will start to gather dust. And um, it makes it really easy to see um, where that is. So, you know, I'm looking on the bottom of the bumps. I'm looking at the shock towers, the motor mounts, all of the axle brackets all the way around. Um, I'm also looking for, you know, um, I've got the ball joint deletes on here that I just um, freshened up. So I'm looking to see if anything looks like it settled or got loose. Um, and then remember, I changed an axle out on the trail. So I'm going to need to go back through and redo that to make sure that it's done really nice. Questions? Uh, your co-driver would like to know if he should be writing this down. <laughs> and uh, other people want to know if we will be a park or desert splash. Um, we, I don't think we're going to be out of desert splash because they moved the dates. I don't, I don't know if everybody's aware of that. Um, that's kind of a bummer. It, uh, it overlaps a little bit with SEMA and, um, that, that was a bit unexpected. I guess there was the people that own the, the park that where, where we host the event at, um, didn't know. And they scheduled something right over the top of it. So it was kind of a disaster. So anyways, they're hoping that next year they'll be able to move it back to the proper date. Yep. Somebody on YouTube, U-joints are an easy trail fix if you have the right tools. Shouldn't you run a lesser strength U-joint so it's the weak spot? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And I always do that on the drive shaft. So out here, this is where my U-joint broke at, at the axle shaft. That's a little bit more complicated. Um, you can't exactly downsize that. Um, you can... Like in my case, I was running a, a factory Dana Spicer one. Now this has got an upgraded like CTM in it. But um, the uh, actually this is one of the Yukon super joints, so that's that's even better. Um, but anyways, when these break, it typically thrashes the ear, so um, you're you're really in a bad situation because a lot of the time, you know, if even if you hear the pop, by the time you stop, it's already made a rotation. I I was very lucky if I didn't realize it that um, a lot of the time if that rotates around and gets jammed it can actually bust the knuckle off so jamie and i have had that happen before and uh you don't get any notice and then the next thing you know you're now stuck in the middle of nowhere so um you really got to pay attention to these things for sure alan you know, so alvarez says jordan found a crack on my chassis can't imagine why oh my goodness where i'd like to know where yeah where alan yeah that's that's interesting um, yeah, I can't imagine why either. Um, but for Alan, he'll appreciate this. Jeff and I just noticed that I hit something really hard right here and it, it actually bent the corner of the steel toe point and the bumper. So um, I'm gonna have to take that off, look underneath there, straighten stuff and uh, get, get that fixed up. So um, that's that was interesting to just see that. I'm always looking at my um, high pressure steering lines that go to my Ram. Um, I'm looking for leaks. I'm looking for, um, cuts like anything can happen. A lot of the time, you know, if you've, if you've hit the tie rod here, you may have damaged the Ram or gotten it to squish these hoses. I have a silicone protective covering on here, um, that I keep an eye on. So over the years, I've kind of developed my own system for this vehicle on what, what I'm looking for. Um, one of the other things I noticed, and I'm, I'm happy to see this, is that I was not using all of my bump stop. Um, so that's good. I still have about a quarter inch there, and uh, that means I have the correct pressure in there uh, because I was certainly going fast enough to use it all. So um, that's nice to see. 
Um, then, you know, a lot of the time I'll, I'll crank on these things and see if, if there's any play. You know, um, if they're super sloppy, then you know um, one or both of the hymns are done. So um, you got to keep track of that. And then, um, and then I'll start going through here and wiping stuff up and getting everything, you know, nice and clean. Um, you know, the radiator's right above here, so I don't see any liquid or any signs that it was leaking. That's, that's good news. Um, the oil pan's a little wet, but I figured out that uh, my dipstick wasn't sealing. So it left fluid on the bottom of the frame and a little bit on the bottom of the skid. So I've got to put a new O-ring in there and get that sealed up. We, we did have it um, tied down so it, it, it can't fly off. It's, it's actually zip tied down, but the seal wasn't good. So when I ran high RPM, it built crankcase pressure and pushed it out of there. So more questions? Uh, one, another event question. Do we go to hump and bump anymore? Um, I don't go to hump and bump. That's now before SEMA, even worse, uh, because typically we're taking vehicles to SEMA to show, and uh, we don't want to thrash them before we go show off. Um, so yeah, that, that's the, both of those events have gotten kind of jacked up, but the one event I do want to talk about is our Turkey run. So that's the reason I'm going through my own Jeep is so that in a few weeks, um, I'm going to be, well, all of us will be out at Johnson Valley for our annual Turkey run. And Jane, we figured out this is like the 13th or something annual uh, one. Turkey? Yeah. No, thir uh, it's yeah, I think last year was the. Well, yeah, yeah, so like the 13th annual. Um, we're out there from the 19th all the way through the 26th. So um, it's a great time. And, uh, you know, you can come for a day or two or the whole time or whatever. Some people come before Thanksgiving, go home, and then, they, you know, other people come after Thanksgiving. It's awesome. We, we build a big fire, camp all together. We got music. We're running trails every day. We're running hard trails, easy trails, like just based on who's ever there. So um, it, it's a lot of fun. If, you're, if you've never been out there or if you have, um, you, you're going to have a great time. And then we'll do, for those that are there, we'll do a Thanksgiving, a potluck Thanksgiving dinner. So a lot of fun. Uh, Alan says, Alan said something. Hang on. Alan said it broke in the front next to his bump stop. Oh, so yeah, that's, that's common. That's where I was just pointing up here. You know, you got to keep an eye on this stuff to uh, make sure. So what was happening was, you know, if you're hammering that bump stop, it puts a lot of stress on the frame. And uh, where is that again? Right, right in here. You know, you want to look on all sides. And by the way, you can see on my frame, this is doubled up right here. So the factory puts in an insert and then they weld around that. So um, not all frames are like that. The later production, which I think Alan's got like a 17, they thinned out some of this stuff and it's a little cheesy. So um, yeah, but you know, I'm looking for this too. I had a wire rotate around and get into the pulley and uh, which wiped out one of my fans. So I'm, I'm looking to make sure that everything is good and tight and nothing's getting near the belts or the pulleys, you know, you always got to consider too that if the belt flies off, is it going to take out something in the process? So we protect those things to make sure that doesn't happen. The other thing, it's good to, you know, get the weight off your vehicle and you want to check some of these lines and make sure that they're not too tight. You know, um, if you're going through the suspension travel, you know, you don't want that stuff being yanked on as you're driving <laughs> along. We have a question from YouTube, our buddy sure. Travis, who wheeled with us last week. Oh, weekend. sure, yeah. Uh, I want to know, if my tie rod looks like someone used a tube bender on it, would you <laughs> recommend that I replace it or just trying to st take the same lines as Alan? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Both? <laughs> so um, whenever you start, you want your tie rod straight. I can tell you that. Um, what, what happens is when this is compromised, as you hit stuff, you know, it's, it's going to, whatever direction it's bent, it's going to be flexing. Um, if you notice, we've talked about this before on Tech Talk, but I actually have a, a needle bearing right here so that no matter how hard I hit this, it can't bend up. And if it can't bend up, then it can't stay bent, right? That's the idea. So um, by shortening the distance, you're, you're less likely to be able to bend it. And um, even if it does get bent, it'll roll on this roller. And uh, that's, a, that's a great um, technique and, and way to do it. So, uh, but yeah, you want that tie rod straight for sure. 
Okay, uh, Scott Vegas from Facebook. I have a factory electric locker. My wire, my wire connection is hanging around my front axle. Is extending the cable required when lifting a TJR? Um, depending on how it's routed. So, James, let's slide around to this side, and um, we will talk about this for a second. So, on, uh, on our Jeeps, on, on all Genrite Jeeps, what we do is we run all the wires and the brake lines run down this upper control arm. There's nothing that hangs out here like the factory. That stuff that's hanging is susceptible to get caught on bushes, sticks, um, rocks can come around and wipe that stuff out. So we, we do our best to hardline all this stuff. And um, in my case, the wires run down here for my front uh, electric locker. So, you know, that's one of those things where it is important to keep that stuff up and tidy. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and, you know, you need to check anything that looks tight um, needs a little bit of slack or, or eventually, you know, uh, it could pull out or it could be your limit strap, by the way. Um, I see that all the time. In fact, I see more broken pivot arms and sector shafts on the Rubicon because somebody put longer shocks on their Jeep and never checked what the, the travel looked like. And they go, wow, I got all this articulation, but something, not the shock, is limiting it, and it's typically the steering. So, um, guys, it's, it's not as simple as just bolting on more stuff. You have to check everything, especially once you want to modify it. I mean, and an easy way to do it is, you know, you can take the shock off, and see if the shock goes further than, you know, your axle is drooped. It's, it's not hard to do. Mm -hmm. So, or the, you do the smart thing and you run a limit strap like I do. Yep. Can they see that right there, Jim? On, on either side. I run, I run a limit strap on all four wheels. Um, by the way, the limit strap um, helps to protect the shocks so that they're not getting yanked. You know, I've seen the top of the shock yanked out, but these limit straps. And again, here you can see the... All the hoses and wires and everything run down the brake lines, down that upper control arm, out of harm's way. So, um, and you can see, you know, a lot of this stuff got pretty scraped. Um, you know, the, the hammer trails are definitely no joke. So, you've got to look after all this stuff. And uh, Jim Reel over at JE Reel builds me a heck of a drive shaft that I can just beat the daylights out of. By the way... Um, for those of you that are astute, I don't know if you noticed, but my slip is not here. You never put the slip here. That's the, the, this would have completely beaten the daylights out of that. The slip's up here. It's actually hidden. And uh, even my uh, balance weight is put up here, so you can't hit it. Because once you knock that off, then the thing's going to run out of round. These are all special things that um, somebody like J.E. Real is very good at and... Uh, you know, is, is one of those top companies that helps me, you know, keep this stuff together. And I'm running 1350 U joints. I know that's a good question on both front and rear. And you can see I got into the front one just enough to take off the sticker. So, uh, someone says, can you show a closer, closer look on the needle bearing on the front of the steering? How does it work? Sure. Sure. Let's go back up there. I don't think we have one out over there, but I can, I office, can but... you get in there pretty good, Jim? Yeah. So the way it works is you weld a nut um, on the back, and it's actually the same nut that we would use like right here. We just weld it on here, and then this has its own little shaft and uh, needle bearing, and it actually has a, um, a needle grease fitting inside of there. And then this little guy rolls on the outside. And these are, these are made for um, like high pressure rollers. So whatever force you can generate here is nothing to this bearing. So um, it's, a, it's a great way to do it. And obviously you've got to have a cover that you can weld to in order to put it on. But, um, you know, and you can see also, you know, like I've got that much, you know, can't even get my finger and I can just get my finger behind. So by not having much that the, the tie rod can go up or back means I can't bend it. So these, these are just like simple, 
simple things that I've figured out over the years. Uh, we have requests from people on YouTube for you to learn how to speak Spanish. Oh! <laughs> people love your videos but don't understand English. Que uh, hora es? That's, that's all I know. It or, sounds or, like they need to learn English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry guys. Uh, um, one of the things I was going to mention too is um, we make this little bracket right here that goes over the diff cover and you can see I've used the heck out of it. Otherwise, I would appeal back the the curry diff skid which is which is totally cool because it's made out of an ar steel which is like what they make a tractor bucket out of compared to the cast iron that's on the differential so everybody else in the industry you know that you're beating the daylights out of the cast iron and here i'm beating the daylights out of a hardened steel and then what i do underneath this is i squirt in some silicone so that even if I tag this hard, it's got a soft dampener behind it before it gets to the cast iron. Yep. Uh, Summer Ann wants to know, correct way to measure for limit straps. Ah, okay. So um, if you fully extend your shock, um, then what you want to do is order um, one inch to half inch shorter. By the way, in, in tension like they are right now, they're actually stretching, believe it or not. I mean, when you're holding in your hand, you're gonna be like, no way does this thing stretch, but when you hang a, you know, several hundred pound axle off of the bottom of it, um, they will stretch. So, and I just replaced that one right when we got out to the Johnson Valley because I noticed mine, the, the stitching was starting to tear. So. Our buddy Stephen Bird says, I think my shock is my limit strap. No, yeah, you don't want that. You don't <laughs> Come want on, that. Steve. Yeah, that's what will happen. You know, it'll hammer it, uh, you know, kind of like um, a dent puller. It'll, it'll keep hammering it until the top of the shock comes off. So, yeah, um, limit straps are like 25 bucks, and it's a cheap investment. So, and you just put a tab or, or find something to drill on the top and a tab down on the bottom. And, uh, yeah, you're good to go. Uh, more questions or yeah a question from youtube he is sure. in between wanting a 40 60 combo or going all 60s what do you recommend for a daily driver two-door jk so um, uh oh and he wants to be <coughs> on 37 to 39 tire range okay yeah then you definitely need to get in so right here <laughs> all right first off the most common thing i hear all day long when, when i'm talking to customers is they're like, no, 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 I only want to go to 37s. Well, once you get it built where you can handle a bigger tire, that, that's, that'll be the last time you ever say that. You're going to want to be on 39s or 40s before you know it. Um, basically, when you've spent the money and gone to a bigger axle, you, you need or will want to get to that bigger tire. Um, I've, I've literally built customer vehicles. They take it one time and come right back and have us put bigger axles in. So um, be smart, be money ahead, sell what you got while it's still worth money, while it's not broken, and get yourself into a 60 for sure. Uh, more questions or keep going? Let's, let's we go, are all caught up. Let's go back underneath, Jim. David Del Vecchio says 70s front and rear. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm running. So, um, okay, so a couple things I wanted to show people. I don't know if they can see this or not, James, is even though I have my exhaust heat wrapped with the, the DEI, um, I don't even know, what, just they just call it exhaust wrap. Yeah. Um, I also built a heat shield, an aluminum heat shield, um, to protect my Johnny joint because there's so much heat coming by this that I don't want to even remotely damage the urethane that's inside here. And if you notice, I've switched out my Zerg fittings for a low profile needle fitting so I can grease my Johnny's. And by the way, I don't know if you caught our last tech talk or, or maybe even the last two, but I showed people what you do is you pop this out. If, if it doesn't take grease, you pop this out, you drill, just, it, it doesn't go far, it only goes like a quarter inch. You drill in there, a little bit of the urethane will come out, you put the fitting back in, and then the grease will go all the way around till you get you know, a really smooth running Johnny joint. So um, those are nice and tight. If I can barely move them, I know they're perfect. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a perfect setup. The Jeep felt great when I was out there. It really handled nice. Everything was smooth. Um, I had the right amount of nitrogen in the shocks. Um, I really spent some time to get um, all of my preloads right, you know, so that I had 
everything right. And then on top of that, as the last piece was the uh, air bumps in the right uh, nitrogen pressure. So that's, that's important too. Um, I've also built a similar um, heat shield right here where the exhaust comes out so that this Johnny joint on the upper link doesn't get too, too hot as well. And um, you can see here, this, this is the bottom of my reservoir. It is, can they see that, James? It is completely sandblasted. So because this was happening, I put on um, a little dirt works boot on here on the bottom of my shock. Otherwise, that same thing happens as a shock shaft in the spring. So um, those are all things that I'm looking for. And then what else to look at on the rear? Like on the rear, yeah, you're inspecting every bracket, um, all the bolts, you know, the torque seal on the bolts. The bridge is a big thing. Um, you know, our buddy Jeff right here had a problem with his bridge. And by the way, it's common. The last time we were, you know, like eight months ago, when we were out, somebody else ripped their bridge off. Mm -hmm. It just happens. So um, the Currys have a bolt-on bridge, but it also bolts on up here. And then you weld on the Johnny's up top. Um, you need to inspect all these welds, all the bolts. Um, that is... Uh, trust me, if that rips off, you've trashed your shocks, your brake lines, like you're wrecking a lot of stuff. So you really want to make sure that your bridge stays on. Um, the, you know, some of you have probably noticed I have an even heavier duty version of the skid plate on the back. Um, we call this one our armadillo. This is actually manufactured by us. And this is 4130 chromoly. This dude is bad to the bone and you could beat the daylights out of it. So um, as you see, I did. Um, and then again, hard lines. I'm also looking to see, you know, if we're throwing that much dirt back here that we're sandblasting stuff, we're probably roosting the brake lines too. So I'm, I'm inspecting all that. In fact, you can see that it completely roosted right through this clamp. Can they see that, Jane? Maybe. So that, that clamp's just wasted and it, it actually busted the, the whole thing off. It busted the top of the bolt off. So I've got some work to do there to get that secured again. Um, I'm looking at the brakes, right? I want to make sure the caliper bolts are still there. The crossover tubes don't look smashed. Um, these brakes are pretty hammered. Like these rotors, they're, they've had a lot of dirt in them and stuff. The fronts look great. All right, question from YouTube. Sure. 2005 LJ, coilovers and 37s. Is changing the slip on the drive shaft easy as just turning around or is there more to it? Well, it depends on how you're set up. A lot of guys have a flange on this side and they, they have a, a standard, you know, yoke on that side. Yeah. So if you're flange, flange, you can flip it. If you're yoke, yoke, you can flip it. But if you're not, then you got to get the proper thing. Well, also like me, if you have a dual carbon, right. you'd need that on your transfer that, case. That right? has to be on the transfer case side. But you can see, you know, this is the same way. The slip's up here. Yep. So um, that way I didn't damage the the slip so all right one more from youtube sure 2000 tj stock motor do i need to sleeve a dana 44 as well as a truss for 37s um are we talking front or rear maybe, maybe. Uh, he did not specify i mean you know the it's a tj right correct okay right. so those those were not thick wall um but what i need to caution you against is this the moment you start putting heat into the tubes to put on a truss, to put on, um, you know, reinforcements, you know, sleeving it and all that stuff. The moment you do, it's getting bent. So um, a lot of the time it's not in your favor, by the way, either. It's going to bend the opposite way that you want it. So typically, you know, when you weld on the top, what happens is it bends this way. And um, then, you know, your front wheels are going like this. So um, you really... Again, once when you when you get a proper axle, everything's there. It's machined in. It's done right, and uh, then you don't have to worry about this. And these are, I think these are three eighths thick, and a Dynatrack is half inch thick, so they're they're plenty thick and they're giant. You know, it's three and three quarter tube. Uh, so we're Facebook. How many times you change your wheel hub five lug? So um, it. it uh, that's that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm not sure if they're talking about front or rear. Front is unit bearing, and I inspect those all the time. Um, I am also, you know, 
uh, probably driving faster than um, anybody who's watching this show. So I'm really beating on him. And uh, I, I think I've only changed one wheel bearing on this. The rear is full float. You, I, you just don't change those. That's a non-issue. The front, um, you know, I race KOH. I've done, you know, lots of stuff. So I pretty much beat these as hard as you can. And, um, but I, I inspect them, you know, like they're going to get inspected right now while, while I've got everything up. And, you know, it's pretty easy. You can just get up here now that the weight's off of it and check. And that's, that's nice and tight. Let me check the other side. That one's got a little play. So now what I got to do is I got to figure out whether that's play coming from the ball joint elites or if it's actually from the wheel bearing. Um, so yeah, I just got to check that. And by the way, I, I like to spin the wheels and just like make sure everything's running smooth. There's no clunking and noise and you know, don't lose the opportunity that once you've got the thing jacked up, like check it all. And you know, obviously you need to check all the beadlock rings. Um, we had a situation this last time we were out, James, I don't know if you can pan down here. Hope, uh, can they see this, Jeff? Here, let me grab the light. Um, we had a situation where this wheel did not get retorqued and it completely ovaled out the lug holes. And um, the good news is, is that when you run a five lug like this, it's what they call hub centric. So the lugs literally just hold the wheel on. All of the load is put on the hub. So um, this, you know, although um, it was moving, it, I really didn't stand a chance at losing it. So that was, that was a, a comforting feeling. And we always get questions about the five lug. And, uh, you know, this has been a standard lug pattern, even for desert racing for years and years and years. So um, it's, it's really a, a strong enough, remember the lugs just hold it on, that this is doing the real work around the, that center bore. So, and then again, you know, we'll retorque all the, the um, beadlock bolts. So I wanted to uh, point yeah. that out. Steve Waterman on YouTube. Yeah. Pros and cons of aluminum, aluminum links. Are you going to aluminum front links? So I am very careful not to drop hard. Um, you know, I'm, I'm cognizant of, uh, of this uh, in particular. So you can build a super beefy, gnarly link, and then what's going to happen is you're going to bend or break right here, right? So you, all of this stuff, guys, um, if you just go out there and wheel like a rock bouncer, something's you're going to break the mount you're going to break the bolt you're going to you can only beef up so much stuff the nice part about the aluminum link these are 7075 from summit machine these will actually flex a little bit but but if you pass the flex point they'll break okay 7075 is very strong it's like steel it's got the same kind of hardness and it allows you to slide along but if you push it too hard you will break it so um, and these are, these are extra beefy. These are two and a quarter. And, um, you know, just, you just want to be able to slide off and land on it and then you can slide. But if, but if you're dropping off stuff and nailing them, you're asking for trouble. So, um, that you just need to be cognizant. Great question though. Is the covering plate steel or aluminum? Hello for, from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Oh, sure. So this is um, also 7075 aluminum. The, the, the motor skid here is steel um, because it has to be formed in order to give me a tight fit up here. But the, the main belly skid is 7075 steel and this is, or 7075 aluminum. And this is uh, 3 8 thick. So, and I go through and I radius the edges. I make sure that it's, um, and then we use flush mounted bolts. You know, this is, by the way, this is also, if you've got a JK Elite, this is a structural component of the system that you, you must have the skid plate on and it must be tight. So it's, it's all part of the system. What else we got? Can I use the 36 gallon gas tank in the JK with a custom suspension? Um, well, if you buy the gas tank first and you design the suspension around it, yes. But what we've done is in order to get the bigger tank in, we've taken out that rearmost cross member 
that the shocks originally went to, and now it ties into our cross member. So, um, yeah. I mean, it, you, actually, I don't know if you can see it from there, Jane, but I've, mm. I've hit the bottom of this pretty good. Mm. It's, uh, it's bent up pretty good. Yeah. So, um, this, by the way, this is a full bladder fuel cell um, that's in here with foam and a dual aeromotive uh, fuel pump with a sump. So this is, this is a pretty um, high end. It's not just a regular gas tank. It's, it's our upgraded one that, that is available on the website. So that's, that's there. Um, uh, question from Adam Barker. Downside to doing steel control arms. Just wait. No. Um, actually, these are not exactly light, um, being that they're solid aluminum. Um, it, it, there, there's a couple of things. Um, one is that if you're paying somebody to build control arms out of steel, then they're welding in the bungs on each side. You know, they got to get the length cut right, weld in the bungs. Then they got to chase the threads in order to get the joints back in. And, um, you know, where when you order the aluminum, everything just threads in and you put it in and you're done. So um, kind of depends on who you're paying and what. Uh, they almost end up being a wash if you're having somebody else do it. Um, the other thing that I did want to mention, um, Jeff, that you and I were talking about was by running a Johnny joint on each end, um, you're taking the shock load out, right? So each time you're like slamming the wheel on rocks or you're hitting this, you're preserving both side mounts, right? You're preserving the belt, the joint, the welds. Um, you know, you can only cycle all this stuff so many times before something lets go. And we, we saw that this last weekend. Um, you know, when the, when the material that you've chosen for your mounts, or if you, you know, God forbid you saw the stock ones, and you're, you're welded to a much thicker tube, what's going to happen is you'll get a nice weld, but it'll eventually just break off the thinner material. The weld and everything will still be there, but the thinner material lets go. So um, that's why we're very careful to run the quarter inch thick with the, you know, this is a 5 16 tube on the rear. So um, very similar materials. So. Alan says his next upgrade, dual, dual fuel pump. Yeah. Yeah, the dual fuel pump is nice. Um, Jamie, are you running that too? Yep. Yep. So it's coming in handy. Yeah, Jamie's got it on a switch. Mine's an automatic system where it senses the uh, drop in pressure and automatically fires the other one. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're landing on these tanks and I don't know if you've ever taken an electric motor. I mean, even a, as a kid and you just whack it with a hammer. Well, if you whack it enough times, pretty soon you'll stun it and it'll stop. So the same thing happens with your fuel pump. Um, you know, you whack that thing enough and pretty soon it's going to be unhappy. And sometimes it's just a matter of the armature like bottoms out on the one side and just gets stalled. So, um, it's just. You know, you, those things only take so much abuse. Uh, we've got a question rolling in. Okay. Uh, how is the tranny staying cool with the skid? That's a good question. Okay, so um, I've got a couple of things that I've done. I, I wish we could drop this skid, but um, not only have I heat wrapped the exhaust, there's also another layer of shielding up underneath here. Um, do you need to follow me with that, James? Where you go? Oh, just, you know, like talking about the, the training and everything. I'm going to can't follow you. Okay, so the, the, everything is heat shielded and the exhaust, including the muffler, is fully wrapped. So um, what I'm doing is completely um, isolating the heat from the exhaust all the way out to the back. And um, even though the belly is flat, you know, there's, there is still air passages right here up over the top of the frame, you know, all the way along. Mm -hmm. And um, that allows, you know, some air to flow, you know, from the front here um, and the sides all the way out the back. So there's enough of a heat exchange to, to get that out. I am also running a cooler. I was cooler. say, should we mention the big, yeah. big button? Okay, so, so <laughs> um, but that I'm running that cooler because I'm also running a very high stall torque converter. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that makes a huge difference. Um, and I'm running a high stall torque converter for a number of reasons, um, most of which is it cushions the drive line. So when we're hammering through the whoop de doos you're not you're not one to one banging that you know entire gear set 
axle shafts, everything all the way through. Um, it's actually cushioning it, so that keeps things alive. What is better, kingpin or ball joint on Dana 60? So I've seen both break. So, you know, that, that whole theory's out. Part of what I don't like about a kingpin is that it's very narrow, um, where this at least spreads it out, so you've actually got more of a bite. Um, you know, of course, they make aftermarket Cs and knuckles and joints, and there, there's, you know, you can spend a fortune on super stuff. Um, but uh, for the most part, on a 40-inch tire, we've had great success with, with this setup, and, and we sell the heck out of them, so. Uh, our buddy Gerald Clark in Canada, have you ever considered U UHMW in order to cushion all skid areas? So um, I know that's a popular option. Um, I elect not to do that because it, uh, you know, you got to put on a pretty thick piece. It would have to be like three eighths or half inch. And I don't want that ground clearance loss. You can look here and I don't know, can they see that, James? Like mm -hmm. the, the slight scrapes, like I am just getting by stuff. Um, there's no giant gouges in this. And if I use the UHMW, what happens is it, it takes up that gap and it gouges. Like it'll, it'll just, like the rock will dig into well, it'll it. it'll stick too. So there's a good chance that at some point it's going to end up on the trail. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it just rips off all yeah. together. I mean, we see that all the time out there. Yeah. This, remember, this is 7075. This has the same surface hardness as steel. So, you know, although um, it's got the light weight of aluminum, I'm, I'm getting the benefits of both. It's not cheap. It's the right way to do it. Um, but, you know, I'm also playing in the big league, so yeah, that's, that's why I have it. Is steel or aluminum better for the gas tank skid? So depends um, how often you're hitting it, you know, how your vehicle's set up. Um, we make them both. And um, when we do go to aluminum, we go to a thicker aluminum, so it does provide more protection. And uh, remember, each of our gas tanks is um, put into a foam-wrapped skid plate so so there is isolation so even though we've hit it there there's it's compressing the foam and not directly hitting the tank so um that's a great question and i i personally would like to go to an aluminum skid um but i'm i'm not easy on stuff so i'm not i'm not sure that would be the right it would save a ton of weight i'd probably save you know literally a hundred another hundred pounds and if i was just doing a desert race pff, heck yeah i'd do that in a second We are caught up on questions. Um, I was going to mention, you know, when we broke this axle, um, one of the guys that was there, um, as we were disassembling it, I handed him the rotor and said, you know, hey, can you put this over there for me? And he was like, what the heck? Um, he's used to his axles, which have the one-ton brakes, and those factory rotors with the cast-in hat are so heavy. Um, just to give you an idea... This kind of a setup um, is 40 pounds per corner lighter. So um, that's, that's a huge difference. By the way, every one pound on your axle is worth 10 pounds on the vehicle. So you, you, whatever you have an unsprung weight that isn't absolutely necessary. So you know if you're talking about the center section, giant ring and pinion, locker, axle shafts, those are absolutely necessary. So if, if you, you don't absolutely need a giant cast brake and you can go with a cool, you know, billet aluminum brake and a, a rotor with an aluminum hat, you're saving a ton of weight. So those are, those are all things to be considered. Yep. What else we got? We are caught up Still on doing questions. Good? Okay. So the other thing I noticed, Jane, maybe we can show it. Um, if you go from right there, um, one of the things I noticed is, you know, this body mount, the factory body mount gets real thin right here, and it's actually, it started to bend. Now, we put a reinforcement tube over on the other side, but you really got to watch these body mounts. They get banged, and it, like, if you go to the one that's right above your head, Jim, this guy here, um, you can see that I had to build a reinforcement here, but it's, you know, just gotten hammered. So, um, those are all things that you have to be cognizant of. Um, when you're inspecting your Jeep to make sure they're not tearing, you know, even like back here, this, this is really known to 
like right here and here where you've hit it, they'll tear. And you gotta stay after that um, or it'll, it'll completely rip off. But otherwise, yeah, I go through um, all of the, the welds. You know, I'm looking at everything to make sure, you know, I don't see any signs of a crack starting, you know, where that dust is gonna collect. And um, everything looks great. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty happy about that. A little messy on the oil right here, but I'll be able to fix that seal and uh, be good to go for sure. Mm -hmm. Curious on the weight of Terramoto and if there's more weight on the front or rear axle. There is more weight on the front. Um, the rear is actually very light. Um, I've tried to move as much weight to the rear as I can. So my transmission cooler is right here. My batteries are right here. The 36 gallon gas tank is all the way in the rear. Um, so, you know, I've tried to push as much weight from the front to the rear, but, um, you know, you still have, um, I am running an LS engine, which is aluminum. That's 150 pounds lighter than the cast iron, but I am running a giant 4L80 transmission. Those are heavy. So, and an Atlas transfer case, you just, again, it's, it's all a matter of, uh, you know, putting the strength where you need it and uh, then, you know, building and having the right spring rate and bump stops and everything to handle what you're asking it to do. How much does it cost to build a Jeep JK at this level? Um, well, that's a good question um, because it involves several steps, right? Um, if, if you were, you can build a JK like this, an elite suspension, and leave the factory engine transmission, we actually have one we're doing right now, and um, you can get the suspension, axles, tires, and wheels. So the, the suspension kit, I think, is about fifteen or $16,000, but you gotta keep in mind, that comes with ten or $11,000 worth of shocks and air bumps. So, um, you know, the, the actual brackets and stuff is pretty cheap. Um, then you do have to have the curry axles. Um, I mean, really the curry axle in the front is the most important versus the rear, but, um, that's what we've designed it around and, uh, we know it works, right? So if you start changing off of what we know works, then I'm not sure what your result is going to be. So, um, you know, and then if you're doing it yourself or you're, um, you know, paying somebody to do it, that's, that's a whole nother deal. And then, um, of course, you're going to want to upgrade the steering to a hydro or ram assist. And um, then, you know, you have brake options when you get the axles. You can go with the standard Dodge 1500, or you can do the upgrade like I did, the R1 six-piston. So those are, those are some of the, the optional stuff. Then you've got the flat belly skid and um, the gas tank. You know, so we've got three different levels of gas tank. Got a 20 gallon, 25 and 36. So um, each of those has a different price point as well. Um, you can go on our website and actually build a cart and see, you know, you can play with components in and out. Um, there's lots of options and uh, kind of figure it out, so. Any plans for engine upgrades before the big day? Um, yeah, the, actually my new engine's over there and um, I, I, I just need to, put a new oil pan on and a couple other little things and then it's ready to go in. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, and that one's, that's hot. That's like 700, maybe a little more horsepower. So TJ LJ front stretch. How are you getting so much without moving the steering box besides the twisted pitman arm? That's, that's the ticket is a twisted pitman arm. So what happens is, is normally the tie rod is behind the drag link. We're able to actually move it in front of that with the twisted pitman arm. So because it's the way it's shaped, it, the tie rod can actually go up inside of it. So um, obviously I can't show you that on this, but um, it, it works really good. We've you know sold thousands of those things and um, everybody has successfully done that. Sure, yeah, we can move back over to the front. If I'm not running coilovers, will limit straps still serve the purpose? Oh yeah. The trap is, trap. yeah, in fact, if you're not running coilovers, you need it even more. And here's why. Because the person asking me is probably um, running a TJ or an LJ. And what you don't understand is the, the top um, bolts 
are held in by two tiny little like quarter inch. So the more you yank on those things, when that pulls out, your spring's gonna go boing, and then you got nothing. And by the way, to get a spring back in on the trail is like a disaster. Um, and part of what you don't understand is, if this side comes out, you might have a chance, you might not have damaged your drive shaft. If this side comes out, you've definitely damaged your steering. And, um, you know, because now the shock was your limit strap. Now there is no limit strap and this thing can just take off. Before I had coilovers, I literally had to leave my, a spring popped out, literally had to leave my Jeep on a trail while somebody ran me to the auto parts store to get a spring compressor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bad, you would think, oh, well, I can just flex it back out and stick it in. No, it's, it's that shock. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> So. Um, people want to know how often does this rig break down on the track? Oh, like I, I can remember one time. This? Yeah. One time when we busted the knuckle. Twice. Oh, you remember twice? Well, that was the first time. And what was the second? You know, like a couple of days ago. Oh <laughs> yeah. When I broke, well, yeah, I broke the U-joint here. Um, but we were able to repair it. I mean, mm -hmm. in both, in both cases, we were able to repair it. Um, I had to walk back and get parts, but you know, I don't carry a spare axle shaft with me. Have they done driver registration for KOH? Can we get tickets based on drivers yet? Yes. Yes. It's finally available. Did Jordan Pellegrino? He did. Yeah. He's all signed up. Everything's good. So please select Jordan Pellegrino car 98. Yee. Yep. Uh, 98, uh, 94 YJ 4.0 auto stock for now. Which suspension do you recommend for stretching at 40 is tracer legend. We'll be converting to a V8 in the future. We'll be used on and off road for East Coast. So love Growler 115 wheelbase. Any update on the YJ stretch frame? So the okay, so the TJ to LJ frame stretch kit works on the YJ. It requires a different interior piece, um, of which we have some because when we made Jamie's, we made some extras. Um, so that that's available. Um, the 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 trick is that. Uh, sheet metal piece where you're going to cut it and need to extend it. Um, Jamie just ended up buying one from, you know, Quadratech, and then it was long enough that he was able to cut it in half and make the two pieces he needed. So anybody could do that. Um, the, the, so if you buy that TJ to LJ kit, which will now be the YJ to LJ kit, um, the rear shock tower is built in. So that's gonna put that in the right spot for you. So then you're gonna to need to match it on the front. And I, I actually would recommend going with the Legend kit on that. Um, it's probably gonna give you a little bit more versatility to um, put things where you want it. And we also sell that in a lot of pieces. So. Plus if you go T Y J to L J, you have more than enough wheelbase for the double triangulated. Oh yeah, yeah. And I would do, I would do the double triangulated for sure. For sure. It helps to protect the drive shaft and you get the best articulation like completely bind free out on the trail. So yeah, good stuff. Uh, people want to know why you prefer the Curry 60 over any other 60. Um, so it's all about this rollback cover. So the, the rollback cover, as you can see, allows me to put the joint, this third link joint way back. So otherwise what would happen is, you know, in a, in, in a regular position is look, you know, maybe I could move the track bar, but I can't move the steering box. So it would be going up right on top of the steering. Right now, this travels all the way up inside here. And I mean way up here. Um, so, you know, having that rollback cover and, and keep in mind, you know, this design is unique to us. I order this axle housing with the top machined. It's drilled and tapped. You can't see there's a, a plate back here that's all part of this upper mount. So this is super strong um, and it's very bind free. I get asked this all the time. What about a, a second link? You don't need that when you put a beefy you know, joint up here with a bigger bolt. Um, we've run this setup for you know, almost 20 years and uh, very successful, you know, uh, even in King of the Hammers, you know, racing. Jordan raced his 4,500 car that way and I've raced this that way and not had an issue. So, yeah. Plus, when people do four-link the fronts of their Jeep, how often do they actually achieve the right geometry? No, they never get it. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of the time they're trying to do it so that they can eliminate the track bar, but you don't want to do that. What The track bar actually gives you the ability to side hill. 
The moment you take away that track bar, your Jeep is gonna just flop over to the stops. And trust me, that'll be the scariest thing you ever experience, short of rolling all the way over. So, yeah. What else we got? Uh, let me check YouTube real quick. Limit no. straps, front and rear, question mark. Front, front coil and rear. rear front springs. Yeah, yeah. front and rear, and for rear. sure. If you have a Jeep, you should just have limit straps on all four yeah, corners. Yeah, and we sell um, what's called quad wrap. Um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm uh, abusing this thing all the time, so I want the most heavy duty. A standard would be a double wrap, almost you never see single wrap anymore. But um, what it means is that there's four layers on this thing, so it's really beefy and um, it's just less likely to stretch or tear, so. Uh, Cameron Harris would like you to know Rhett says hi. Hey, Rhett, nice to know you're watching. <laughs> yeah, and, that's uh, cool. People on YouTube wanna know why, you're, if, why you prefer the U-joint axle shafts opposed to an RCV. Ah, so um, actually I have, I've, I've recently received RCVs. Um, I just haven't had time to put them in. Um, and I've, I've had great luck running the Yukon Super Joint, you know, so um, I, I just haven't been pushing to do that. The one that broke over here was just a standard, and it was like nine years old. So um, I think I even raced KOH on that one, so yeah. it's been in there a long time. So, but let's back up a second. If that U-joint didn't break, what would have broke? Yeah, so typically that would have been uh, maybe a stub, or maybe the hub, maybe. Um, I'm also running the Yukon, you know, heavy duty hubs, the, the locking hubs. Mm -hmm. So um, those, what I like about those is they're a fail to lock. So that's, that's a very comforting feeling when you're out there. Um, and now that I broke this U-joint, I also need to get in here and inspect this because that shock load, a lot of the time can damage other things. So I need to pull the cover, look at the ring and pinion, see if anything looks cracked or chipped. Um, this is this is a little bit bigger. This this needs to come apart now. So cool. Uh, I know you've said this before, and I cannot find it. But what bolt pattern backspacing? All the wheel spec are the specs for the wheel for the tracer setup. For the tracer setup. So the the tracer is typically a five on five and a half with four and three quarter backspace on a on a 17 by eight and a half wheel yep and i don't like anything wider than eight and a half do not go nine nine and a half ten do not do that eight and a half is it it gives you the right amount of bulge on the tire you need that sidewall what else we got we are all caught up in quite oh can i go low center gravity with just a two and a half inch lift sure yeah, I mean, what, what you really want to do is you want to put the biggest tire you can with the least amount of lift. And um, if that means you got to put high fenders on, whatever it is you do, you want to stay low. Um, this is up in the lift right now, so it looks like it's really tall, but when this sits on the ground, it is low. And um, that makes a huge difference when we're off camber, when I'm sliding around a corner. Um, there's going to be some video coming out in the next few weeks of you know, what I just did this last weekend, and you will not believe how I'm driving this thing. Um, I, if, if, if you're anything short of impressed, I, I would be surprised. We are all caught up and we're about at the end. Okay. So. Well, as always, it's great um, for everybody to join us. I really appreciate it. And uh, don't forget to download our app um, on Apple or Android. Um, again, it's the one-stop shop where you learn everything Genrite. It's, it's got links straight to the website, our social media, our events. Um, there's discussion groups in there. It's, it's really everything Genrite. And uh, again, there's also a spot in there for you to give us feedback about the app. If, uh, if you'd like to see something different, we're, we're open to suggestions. Um, it's brand new for us. And, uh, you know, we're, we, we want to build a community on this stuff. So the Gen Right Nation. So, all right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. And we'll see you next Wednesday.